Good evening, listening audience. Uh, my name is Henry Mohammed. Uh, I've uh, been graciously invited to uh, do a series of discussions here on LPGA uh, 64, Love, Peace, and Joy 64 radio. Uh, and I consider it a great honor to be able to speak to you today. Uh, <clears throat> on these uh, opening discussions uh, and I pray to pray to God Almighty that uh, that we get understanding or we benefit from the discussion that we'll be having today uh, I'd like to first start off with prayer uh, I'm going to give a prayer in in, uh, in the Arabic language, uh, the, the language uh, of the Quran, and then I'll translate it into English. I'll translate the Arabic into English. So we always start off with the most often said prayer, which is called El Fatiha, the opening the opening chapter of the Quran. All prayers basically come from the Quran. They come from the Quran. And the most often said prayer is called El Fatiha. Uh, so let me begin. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Malik Yawmiddin. Iyaka nahuru wa iyaka nasta'in. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqim Sirat al-latina yanamta alayhim Wa'ayur al-mahdubi alayhim Wa'ad-da-alim And And the translation of that Is With the name of God The merciful benefactor The merciful redeemer All praise is due to God The cherisher and the sustainer of all the worlds. The most gracious, the most merciful, the master of the day of judgment. Thee alone do we worship, and thine aid alone do we seek. Show us the straight way, the way of those upon whom thou hast bestowed thy grace and thy favors, those whose portion is not wrath, and who go not astray. Amen. So today, we're going to be coming from, in our, in our talk discussion, we're going to be coming from the Bible, Bible language, and we're going to also be coming from Quranic language to show the similarities and the common language that God re revealed to all of his prophets uh, from Adam to Muhammad the last. The language that God revealed is a language that steers man and guides man, the human being, towards the best life that uh, God designed for the human being to have. When we say the best life, we're talking about the, the thinking process, the entire life, as well as the thinking process. <clears throat> so today, we're going to be discussing the growth of correct thinking or, how, or staying on the path as God designed for us to stay on as far as our thinking processes are concerned. Because without good thought, without intelligent thought, man falls. Society suffers when the thinking of man decreases or falls. The entire society falls when the thinking of man loses 
a moral base and the guidance that God revealed. So we're going to start off with uh, in the book of Genesis. <coughs> and as, if you listen to the word or look at the word Genesis, you can see here clearly that this word Genesis is a word that means beginning. You know, we have uh, genetics is a word that stems from the base of Genesis. And we know that genetics, which is a science, uh, it talks about the small beginnings and how the human being develops from small, insignificant, and uh, even sometimes unthought of beginnings and grows to become a complex, well-designed, well-organized uh, creation of God. So today we're going to start with those beginnings. <coughs> so let me read to you here a formula uh, that God expressed in the book of Genesis. Uh, it's the second chapter in Genesis. <coughs> and uh, it, it reads as follows. It says that God told the human being that he could eat from any tree in the garden. This is the 16th chapter, and the 16th verse, and the, pardon me, the 16th verse and the 17th verse of the second chapter of Genesis. Second chapter, 16th and 17th verse. And it says here, and the Lord God commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat thereof for the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die that's a very powerful verse set of verses there it explains a process of how man can reach high aspirations or grow to become the best human being he can become, he or she can become, or man can fall to become the worst of human beings. And it's all has to, it all has to do with the diet. It all has to do with the diet. God says you can eat of any tree in the garden. Just don't eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So when we talk about knowledge, we're not talking about apples or oranges. We're not talking about physical things. We know apples and oranges and physical food is food for our physical body. But we know that knowledge is a food for our mind. Knowledge is a food for our thoughts. Knowledge is a food for our spirituality. So here God is telling us that what is on these trees was on this tree was knowledge. And the knowledge that we shouldn't eat is a knowledge of good and evil. Now, we might ask ourselves, well, what's the knowledge of good and evil? Well, we know that knowledge of good is the revelation of God, the message that God revealed to his prophets. That's the knowledge of good. And that knowledge is a light. It says truth is a light, right? We say in society, truth will set you free. Right? So truth, the truth of God is a is a very powerful knowledge that will raise the mind of human beings and grow the mind of human beings on the path that God designed for human growth, for human thinking, 
to grow in. That's the path we want to grow on. We want to grow on the decent, moral, upright path that God designed for us to grow on, or to, to grow within. But here there's a, God is telling us there's also another knowledge, a knowledge that has a knowledge of good and evil. And the day we eat of that knowledge, knowledge of good and evil, something inside of man dies. Something is corrupted in, the, in, in, in man when man feeds his mind a knowledge that has in it truth mixed with lies. If truth will set the mind free, then lies would destroy the, would destroy the mind. It would cripple the mind. It would enslave the mind. If truth is a light from God, then lies, the knowledge of lies, will blind the man, will blind the mind of man. So this is a very simple and easy to understand concept. Just like healthy food will give you a good physical health, the knowledge of God's revealed message from his prophets will, will give you good human thought process and the type of life that is healthy, the type of society that is healthy, and eventually the type of world that is healthy. This is what, we, this is what we're striving now to understand. So if there's, if there's, if God is warning us not to eat poison knowledge, then we want to find out what is the best knowledge to feed ourselves and what is the poison knowledge that we don't want to feed ourselves. When we think about that, that seems like a, a complex question. But really, it's not. We, when we look at the Ten Commandments, God tells Moses, says, Moses, tell your people that they should not, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any likenesses of anything in the heavens above, in the earth beneath, or in the waters under the earth. <clears throat> that we are not to bow ourselves down to them, nor serve them. Now look at how expressive, look at how expressive God is in this language. God is telling us that whatever we find in the heavens above, God knew we would be able to reach out into space. God knew we'd be able to travel out into space. But God is telling us, whatever you find when you go out into the space, into the heavens, don't make that your Lord. Don't bow down to it. Don't serve it as a God. God knew we would be exploring the earth. He knew that we would be able to look into the intricacies of the uh, of cell division and the intricacies of the, of the earth and the waters and the oceans. But God is telling us Whatever we find there, that we're not to bow down to it nor serve it because it's not to be seen or worshipped as a God. That's a healthy knowledge for us to understand. And it's really a very easy to understand concept. 
Nothing is worthy to worship except God. And God is unseen. God is invisible, ever present, and never, ever, ever absent at any time or at any place. God is the one who is in control of every situation. God is the knower of all things. God is the almighty, needing no help from anyone or anything at any time. This is God. This is how the believers who believe in one God understand their creator. Isn't that a healthy way to understand the creator? When you check scriptures, you see that that belief system that we just mentioned agrees with scriptures. It agrees with Bible. It agrees with Quran. It agrees with the Torah. That God is unseen, yet ever present and never ever absent. All hearing. Nothing escapes the consciousness of God. That's a very clean, healthy, morally upright concept that any human being can feed to their child or feed to themselves. That's what we want for a society. We want an upright society. But when we add other concepts to that, incorporated into that concept, if we make God visible, when we know that God is invisible, if we make God visible physically, then we've, then we've broken that law that God said or revealed to Moses. That's a very simple concept. So the words that God revealed, those beautiful words that express how we should understand our creator, those are the words or the knowledge that we should be rooted in, that should be our foundation. And that word, those words become, as we said, food for our thoughts. Food for our thinking. Food for guidance as to how we should live our life and treat other human beings. And not just other human beings, but the entire earth, the entire creation. You might say, well, why do you say that, uh, Brother Muhammad? We say that because we also know that our creator, our, the one who we worship alone, that that creator is responsible for the entire creation. Every speck of dust, every grain of, or every leaf of grass, everything in the entire universe was created by God and God alone. And in everything that God creates or has created, God has left information for us. God has left information for us in his creation. So when we study his creation, when we study the things that God made, we, we learn from that. God's creation teaches us and it gives us knowledge and once we receive that knowledge we are able to grow but we should always bring to mind 
that it is God, it is our creator who has created this creation and he is the only one that deserves credit for what he created. This is a very important and a very uh, useful tool that God has given us that will help us to stay on track. Because when we give praise to something else or someone else for the work that God has done, that's when man begins to miss the mark. He's feeding from a tree that is really a knowledge of good and evil because that particular line of thought will lead man into worshiping something other than God or giving credit to something other than God when God alone is the only one that deserves the worship. As I say, this is the first in, this, in, a, in a series of discussions, and pretty soon we're going to be able to have, uh, God willing, we'll have questions and answers, uh, you know, so we can we can uh, have more interactive discussion. <clears throat> but right now, we're working towards we're working towards that goal. So as we, as we move along that train of thought, that it is God who is the one who is responsible for the entire creation. But when we are given an idea that tells us something other than God has, has a share or a responsibility or has a uh, not a responsibility, but has a uh, uh, a portion, deserves a portion of the worship that should only go to God, that's when man makes a mistake. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, I have not come to the destroy the, the law of the prophets. I have, not, I have not come to change or destroy the law of the prophets. I have not come to change what the, what the prophets taught. I have come to fulfill what they taught. I have come to show you how to live what they taught. So if Jesus say, I have come not, I have not come to change the law of the prophets, I have not come to destroy the prophets, then that tells us that he was in agreement with the law that God gave to Moses. And that Moses, and that law said, nothing in the heavens above, nothing in the earth beneath, nor nothing in the waters under the earth should be served or worshipped. Only God should be served and worshipped. And if we, if we make something else of God besides God, we put ourselves into a psychological grave. Not a physical grave so much, but a mental grave. A grave where man falls in his thinking, in his behavior, where man falls to become almost like a beast. And a beast is known for what? Appetite. A beast is known for appetite. Words make people. Words make people. If you want to become a doctor, study the words of medicine. And eventually those words of medicine 
will mold you and shape you in your mind until you become or you're able to do the physical works of a doctor. But it's the words that transformed you into the doctor. You want to become a lawyer? Study the words of law. And those words of law will transform your mind until you're able to do the works or have the behavior of a lawyer. The words that God revealed to his righteous prophets and servants, those words will transform your life until your life becomes the type of human life that God designed for you, for you to live. The type of morally upright, intellectually alert, family-oriented lifestyle that man can flourish in and grow and have a future. But when someone infuses the wicked concepts of false knowledge into the religious world of man and man is not consciously aware the mind is not consciously aware that it has been fed a knowledge of good and evil when that happens something inside of the, the man dies and the man falls in his thinking and his thinking becomes lower and lower almost on the beast level, as we just said. And the beast is known for appetite. The tiger or the lion, they don't have a moral sensitivity when they are about to eat a, 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 a young deer. They don't say, you know, I'm not gonna eat this deer today. This deer is too innocent. This deer is too weak. And his mother, this deer's mother loved him very well. I don't want to take this little innocent deer away from his mother. I'll, I'll, eat a, I'll eat something else. I won't eat this deer. The lion or the tiger doesn't say that. They are driven by appetite. They could care less how much that deer or baby baby gazelle cries out. They'll take their long four inch uh, razor sharp claws and rip the baby gazelle wide open and begin to eat the baby gazelle right there on the spot. Because they're not concerned about the, 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 the weakness or the innocence of that baby gazelle. They're only driven by appetite. When society of, when man, the society of man begins to take on that type of thought process, then something terrible has happened in the religious life of man. That kind of behavior is fine for a tiger or a lion, but when man becomes like that, the society is suffering from sickness. The society has been poisoned by a knowledge body, a body of information that has slipped into the subconscious mind of the man or the society and caused the thinking to go awry, to go berserk. It's our job to begin to point these things out. It's our job as, as human beings to share information that God 
shared with, with us in, in scriptures, Bible and Quran and Torah, that will help us get a grip on what we see taking place in our society, in our communities, in our families, and in the individual. Because the individual is, is an extension, pardon me, the individual is, is a, uh, a microcosm of the whole society. The society is made up of individuals. So it's our duty to share information that will help us to correct the problems of fallen life here in America and the world. And the first place that we have to look at when we want to find the beginning of problems is in the diet. Nine times out of ten, if you get a stomach ache and you eat something that didn't agree with you or might have had tainted food poison or something of that nature, you didn't realize it when you ate it. You didn't realize it had poisoning in it, in the physical food. But later, you begin to get sick. Your stomach begin to hurt and ache. Your body begin to cry out and tell you something is wrong. Until you got up and went to the doctor. And then the doctor began to examine you and began to ask you, well, what did you eat yesterday? What did you eat an hour ago? Because whatever you ate an hour ago or yesterday is causing you serious problems today. It's the same for the mind of man and the spirituality of man. There's evidently there's a body of knowledge that we've ingested psychologically that we took we took in as food for our thought we took that knowledge in and buried within that knowledge was a, was a was a poison and that poison slowly began to cripple our thinking in the world and it brought us to where we are today and we we should be ever thankful to God that we that we now have a idea we have a concept of what has happened in the thinking of man because we know that knowledge we use knowledge to think with right thinking brings right uh, behavior. Wrong thinking brings wrong behavior. But the thinking has a beginning spot too. The thinking, the thinking has a genesis that it starts from. What is it? It's the concept, the word. The word, words create thought processes and thought processes influence behavior. So it's word, thought, behavior. If, 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 if something is taking place that is incorrect in the concepts of man, in man's concepts, and belief system, then in time, that false concept will develop into false thinking. And then the false thinking will turn into false behavior. So we have to always start at the, at the, at the word. We have to start at the concept, conceptual level. What is the most powerful of all concepts, the purest 
the most immaculate concept that man can think with, the most immaculate concept that a human being can think with is that there's but one almighty, all-powerful, ever-present and never-absent creator who's in control of every situation at all times. And it is that almighty, all-powerful, all-hearing creator that our that, that we should be focusing our devotion towards. Now, when we do that, that's going to begin to bring a new respect to our minds. Why? Because if we have reverence and great respect for the all-powerful creator, then we're going to also have powerful respect for what the, what the creator created, which is each other. We'll have great respect for the human being that God created, which is us. We'll be able to look at each other and see dignified images, dignified position within our own life and within the life of other human beings. But if the human being is trained to think that everything about him is bad, there's no goodness in him. That he's wicked beyond repair. Those types of thoughts will drive the human being into an inferiority that he'll never be able to escape. When we study scripture, the language of scripture, we can see that God created man, according as the Quran says, in the, in the very best of modes. The very best of God's creation. That's the human being. That's how God created us. In the best mode. And does the Bible agree with that? most certainly does. The Bible says that God made man to be the caretaker over the earth. It says it, it says it like this. It says that the Bible says that God gave man dominion over the earth. He gave us dominion over, over the earth didn't give the earth dominion over us. God gave us dominion or leadership or care, care, being the caretaker over the earth. That's a very dignified and honorable role that God bestowed upon his human creation. So once we understand that we are God's creatures, we're God's creation. And we shouldn't disrespect, we shouldn't disrespect what God has created. You know, when you're a child, kids, a kid might get out there and start stepping on the ants or catching the fireflies and pulling the, pulling the backs off the fireflies. But as we become adults, as we become older, we realize that these, these creatures, they have a, a life in them that God created. And we should respect that. So if we can do that for the smaller creatures, shouldn't we be just that much more respective 
of each other's humanity? We certainly should. We should be respective of each other's humanity simply because God created all human beings. And that deserves to be respected in itself. You know, all we have to do is stop and think. When we think, God begins to show us how easy it is for us to get our lives back. You know, if you go to a museum and they have a, a picture by Picasso or a portrait by Michelangelo or some famous painter, painter, artist, and they might have it valued at so many millions of dollars, and they have it behind all types of protective glass, then they have guards standing post over it to make sure that no one harms that painting. If we can feel like that about a painting, how much more should we feel that we should protect the dignity and the humanity of other human beings? How much more? We should see each other as God's most precious creation. Not a painting by Picasso. Not a painting by Michelangelo. We should see other human beings and recognize the, the excellence that God put in them. We shouldn't look at human beings and say, oh, they, they'll never make it. They're wicked. They're bad. That's incorrect thinking. That's incorrect thinking. So, as we begin to conclude today's short discussion, uh, I, I just want to say I, I really enjoy and I'm very uh, appreciative uh, to Brother Robert uh, who allowed me to come on to this radio podcast uh, <clears throat> and to share with you a few ideas, a few concepts that uh, I pray to Allah, pray to God that will work to bring us closer together. That will work to bring us uh, to a position where we are able to work to bring about better communities, better family lives, better human lives. And again, as I said at the beginning, I, I'll say it as we begin to end, that it is only God and the respectful God's creation that will bring us to have true love for each other. True love, true love is a love that is willing to tell the truth regardless of the, of the, of, of the circumstances that it might bring because number one, if you love someone, you don't want to see them hurt. If you got a parent or a child or a very close friend that's addicted to cigarettes, drugs, alcohol, you know what I'm talking about. You will tell them in a minute, look, don't do that. That's not good for you. Now, they'll, they might argue with you about it. But you continually tell them, why? Because you care about them. You won't just sit there with them and, at least you shouldn't, <laughs> at least you shouldn't. You won't just sit there with them and indulge in them in, in things that you know are harmful, things that you know are destructive.
that's where that's where we are now today. And I pray to God that everything we talked about today will help to enlighten someone. And as I say, we're going to eventually have interactive uh, conversations where we can entertain questions and, and begin to dig in to the, to the concepts that have caused so many of us in society serious problems. So with that being said, I'm going to close as I came in, close out with prayer. As I said, this prayer is the most often said prayer uh, uh, by Muslims. Uh, it's the first chapter of the Holy Quran, and you know, I'll say it in Arabic and I'll say it in English. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, ya Rabbi al-Alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Malik yawmiddin. Iyya kanabulu wa iyya kanasta'in. Ihdina sirat al-Mustaqim. Sirat al-Latina inamta alayhim. Ghayr al-Mahdubi alayhim wa al-Dhalim. Amen. And the translation, with the name of God, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer, all praise is due to God, the cherisher and the sustainer of all the worlds, the most gracious, the most merciful, the master of the day of judgment. Thee alone do we worship, and thine aid alone do we seek. Show us the straight way, the way of those on whom thou hast bestowed thy grace, those whose portion is not wrath and who go not astray. Amen. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. All right. Okay, that's uh, How long was it?